And we're going to look at a political party funding. Uh, the IEC, of course, releasing its data for the first quarter of the 2024-25 financial year and uh, stating then the political parties that have made declarations. 14 political parties have um, made declarations for that particular uh, quarter and it's it sits at a total of 190 million rand uh, that has been declared. Joel Bergman is a senior researcher at My Vote Counts. He joins me for this conversation. Joel, good morning. Um, hi, Kathy. Nice to chat. Michael Atkins is an independent elections expert. Michael, good morning to you. Hi, good morning. So certainly in terms of the reporting cycle and the parties that we're seeing reporting, it's 14 parties. It's still a drop in the ocean um, compared to the number of political parties that actually participated and contested in the election. Should we be worried about that? Jill? Oh, <clears throat> thanks, Abby. Um, so... My vote counts is quite pleased on the face of it that we are seeing disclosures made during this past period. And I'm sure listeners will be aware that for the past few months, um, up until August, there was a lacuna in our party funding legislation, right? That meant that there was actually no legal obligation for parties to make the, these, these disclosures. So it is quite encouraging that parties have come forward and, 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 and we have this information. but. We can't say with certainty that this is representative of every single donation that should have been disclosed. Um, we must also take into account that while there are you know, uh, many, many parties that contest, uh, it is the, the bigger parties are always going to be able to secure the majority of, of, of large donations. And for you, Michael, while my vote counts as feeling positive, of course, this is the highest number of declaration that um, of we have had so far since the reporting began. Um, are you confident that the switch with political parties is taking place around how engaged they are in this process? Look, I, I agree with Joel that the uh, reporting is encouraging. Um, obviously, the law doesn't have all of the teeth that it might to be able to check and to query, uh, you know, perhaps an absence of declarations that, that it might be surprising. So it, it is an encouraging development and trend, but there's a lot that we don't know and the, there's no easy way to find those things out. For example, it's been in the news this week that Action SA is challenging the IEC on the the matter of the s sort of supposed uh, donation that allowed the ANC to settle their outstanding debt a few months ago. You know, so there are there are questions and there's probably areas in the law that could be improved. Joel, when we look at the figures objectively, one thinks, okay, 190 million rand. This was during the peak of the election cycle. Are we to believe that for the political parties that have declared collectively um, that they would have spent only 190 million <laughs> rand or somewhere around about that for the election campaigns? No, I mean, we know that elections are cost a lot more money than that. Um, the big parties spend hundreds of millions of brands on general election campaigning. Um, but we can't look at this only in, in, in isolation, right? So parties have other sources of revenue, which isn't always and falls under our political party funding legislation. So parties take out loans from banks. Um, they have investment vehicles, like, which don't always, uh, um, which can lead to um, not disclosing those, those sort of sources of information. Um, and we are, you know, it's, it's also possible that we are going to see in, um, in the future disclosures that there will be um, information there related to payments that were made sort of during this time. But no, 190 million rand is, like you said, a drop in the ocean of what this actually costs. But what does that do then for the effectiveness of this mechanism? Because behind it was... 
uh, you know, a, a, a principle of transparency, right? That if we know who's funding political parties as the electorate, then we're able to make really informed decisions about um, who the parties are likely to be um, listening to or to having around the table or who's likely influencing, right, these, these individuals. So if then the reporting itself is not giving us a a clear picture of who some of these players might be. Is it effective? Well, if, if I can come in there, the there are questions, obviously, about the effectiveness of the legislation. I think it's clear that we have made huge progress in, in terms of transparency and accountability since the legislation became effective three years ago. And uh, listeners are perhaps not aware, if I can, from the outside, uh, remind people of the work done by My Vote Counts, My Vote Counts over many years in litigating and, and pushing for this kind of transparency. But we do need to see from now what can be done to improve the transparency and improve the confidence that the, the numbers we are seeing re, uh, reflect the reality. So what then are we to read, uh, Michael, into the current data? Well, some of the where disclosures are made, they're interesting. And so people can draw conclusions on those. There are some questions. So, for example, there are questions about certain foundations and are foundations being used to channel money from some of the people who individuals who are donating in any case. And while I cast no aspersions on the particular situations, asking questions is not a an insult or a slur in a, in a democracy. So for example, we are the people who have donated to Rise and Zanzi. You know, we don't know a lot about where that money has come from. It's a relatively new organization. So, you know, the disclosures, the fact that they uh, raise those questions is a really positive step for our democracy. And as I say, it, it's I think some of us think that the legislation can go further and we can build on the work that's been done up to now. When we look at these disclosures, these disclosures, Joel, even for the first quarter of the year, we're not necessarily seeing um, a lot of new funders uh, mm. coming into the system. It seems to be, you know, the same, by and large, uh, you know, the same group of people that is funding political parties. What does that tell us <laughs> about um, the state of our politics, but also the interests in these political organizations? I mean, that, that's very much the case, Kathy. And I think what it, what it speaks to is the fact that our, um, we have a, a small group of wealthy individuals, organizations, businesses that dominate the, the funding of our politics and that hold potentially a disproportionate level of power. Um, in influencing, you know, influencing our politics. Um, something that Mother Accounts is working towards, we, we, we're conducting research around, you know, trying to understand um, what a better mix of funding would be. And potentially we think that public funding should maybe be something we should look deeper into. I mean, parties collectively get, I think, more than one and a half billion rand every year in public funding. And that might be a way so, to minimize so, so private interest. I'm looking at some of the funding that came through for Action SA. They declared uh, just over 13 million rand. Uh, an organization like Build One South Africa, they declared um, 12.8 um, million rand. The IFP, 38 million rand. Uh, Rise Mzanzi, 33 million rand. So, you know, these are significant amounts of money. What does that tell us about um, these political parties? Because uh, these are political parties who are contesting these elections for the very first time 
in in 2024. Joel? You, you know, uh, s- sorry. Um, yeah, go, go ahead, Michael. Briefly, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Briefly comment. You know, so, South Africa is a young democracy. We are transitioning from the apartheid era. We all understand this, and we all understand that the pieces didn't just drop into place in 1994. We are developing and growing. And so as certain parties are coming forward to try and change some of the picture of, of, of the landscape of our politics, the fact that some of those have drawn funding, to my mind, is not hugely surprising or sinister. It It is a reflection that there are people in the country who are saying, we, we need to, in a way, try out different options in, in the country and, and different configurations of what our politics can look like. And it's I see it as part of the maturing of our democratic environment. And if I, if I could just add to that, Kathy, I think what we also see is donors donate, donating to multiple parties. So, in, you know, it's sort of a, a hedging of bets, you know, they are if they are agreeing with the vision of, of that of that sort of party or that sort of sector of parties, so if they fall within the same sort of general ideology, um, we are seeing that donors don't necessarily only donate to, to a single party. One of the concerns that many South Africans had was around parties that were, or organizations rather, that were NGOs that were donating to political parties, but it wasn't really clear about what these NGOs do. How far should the work of understanding uh, the funding of political parties be going? So to what extent um, should members of the public also be asking questions of the donors themselves? So if you look at an individual like um, um, Martin Moshal, who of course is, is, is a regular donor to some of these parties. Should Martin Moshal be asked, well, why are you actually um, funding political parties to the extent that you're, do, you, that you're doing? And you seem to be sort of very clear about who it is that you will fund. What is your interest in this? Joe? I don't think we'll get to the point of sort of expecting or forcing donors to come forward with, you know, with their list of reasons for funding. I think what's important is the transparency element. So knowing who the donors are. And it might be, you know, it's, it's all good and well where we can identify an individual like Martin Moshal. But when you have, as, as Mike mentioned, you know, uh, we are the people and other entities which, you know, we, where you go and see how they see, they don't seem to be registered, you can't find the directors, you don't actually know who they are. I think that's more traffic. So I think, yeah, to expect donors to sort of lay out the laundry list of what they're doing, I don't think that will happen. But we need to know, you know, who is actually making these donations. Michael? Yes, I agree. Um, I don't think in an open democracy, anybody can question the motivation of an individual. We have the freedom to vote for whom we wish. We have the freedom to donate or to work for any political party. But I do agree that the... The, any of those foundations, we need to see whether they are being used to channel money in a sense to hide the origin of the money. Mm. Uh, and I mean, I'm not saying that that is the case, but you know, we don't have any information, but these are questions that should be asked uh, in our environment. And I think the law does need to go further in this respect. What makes a donation from We Are The People, which of course has donated significantly um, to Rise Mzanzi, what makes that different to a donation perhaps from uh, another NPC, such as Voices of, of, of South Africa Foundation? Michael? Look, again, I don't. I don't see a major difference, um, you know, between the, the the two that you 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 mention. Um, if we know the background of the organisations, it would be good to see the money flows because, you know, if, if there are if there's a transaction and it's a it's just really a a, a 
pass through, you know, then the, then there is a concern. There are other entities where the origins are known. So, for example, the two trusts that donate to the ANC, we know those were set up for the ANC, and there are their own questions around that. But um, the two that donate to the ANC, that's not in a way sinister because there's no real indication that that is a way to hide a donation. We we know the background of Chancellor House. We we know the background of the Bartha Bartha Trust. So, you know, I, I think it comes down to the particulars, and it would be good to have more information about the particular organisations that are donating. But if 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 uh, I go back to what Joel has said, Joel is saying that. There isn't a point in this process where donors themselves actually have to then answer questions. So about, you know, why it is that they're funding political parties or even what the source of those funds is. Does it not become a bit of a red herring then? I'm not saying it's right, but I'm just saying that in terms of the consistency uh, of, 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 of accountability is raising questions around whether or not we are the people um, is a legitimate NPO that is uh, funding an organization like Rise Mzanzi, does that not become a red herring in the broader context of what else is expected from the other funders? You know, if there was, for an example, uh, an organization that raised funds by getting small donations from people across the board, and you know it was known that these were small and if it was known that uh that uh, uh npo was going to fund various political parties in the interests of furthering democracy th then there would be no problem because th 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 there's no hiding the i think the main concern is not so much the motive of giving um that's up to the voters to see the declarations and make their decisions I see the main problem as whether an organization is used to hide the source of funds and hence get round the the legislated limits. That that's the main question. You know, we can't question people's motives yeah. because we have freedom. You know, we have the freedom to make political choices. And then I mean, just, just but, hang on for me, Joel. We'll, we're going to but, continue the conversation <laughs> in a moment and I'll give you a chance to jump in as well. We're looking at political party funding. Uh, so you heard some of the numbers. You heard some of uh, the organizations that are funding these political parties. What does that tell you? What are you reading into um, how uh, funders are choosing to distribute their, their funds across political parties. I'll take your contributions on that. You can send through your WhatsApp uh, voice notes on 0614-104107. It's just after 11.30. Time. The Talking Point with Kathy Motlatana. Weekdays, 9 a.m. till midday. You're listening to The Talking Point. Our final conversation this morning is looking at political party funding. Joel Bergman is senior researcher at My Vote Counts and Michael Atkins is an independent elections expert. We've been unpacking some of the numbers and I think um, the important conversations around trying to understand what is behind the reporting and paint a picture really of uh, what we're seeing emerge. Joel, you wanted to come in come in here and this was on the issue of the question marks that have been raised in particular around some of the NGOs that have funded political parties and I think we've highlighted um, we are the people that has donated to Rise Mzanzi that had a lot of question marks around it but of course they have continued um, to to fund the organization. Mm. So I just wanted to stress uh, I mean that I think you know, we our own subjectivities can't come into this. You know, if we are um, don't agree with the politics of a certain donor, you know that 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 shouldn't be the issue. As long as we have, as long as we continue to deepen transparency in this in this space, that's something we actually we mother counts is going to court for later this year, which is one of the the points of relief we are seeking. Um, I think I think that should be the focus. As long as we you know and we but we must 
push for um, and ensure that we know who these foundations are. Um, because as Mike said, you know, that, that is one of the key ways in which secrecy can continue to occur in, in party funding. In terms of the point that, that Michael was raising, that yes, these um, NPOs don't have to explain why they're funding a certain political parties, but there must be a, a level of clarity around the source of, um, of their funds. Mm. How do you think that organizations like yourselves, uh, Joel, at My Vote Counts, can go about seeking that transparency? Because, of course, uh, you know, where the people has, has denied sort of any of, of the allegations around them being used as a vehicle to hide the true source of, of, of these funds. But that's the, that, that's the explanation that they've given on, on record. Mm. What more can be done? to try and get clarity and, and to try and get answers? So, I mean, we can, we can either do it through strengthening our legislation and putting in place laws that, con that compel uh, deeper disclosures where this information becomes known. Um, we can do it through um, prior requests, through using our access to information legislation. And then we can also do it through putting pressure on political parties, you know, voters, the electorate or the public has a right to know this. And they voted, you know, parties into power and it should be evident as to where they get their funding from. What are the concerns in terms of the source of, of, of funding? What's What are the worst case scenarios, Joel? Why is it important that we know where the, the source of these funds come from? So, I mean, the, 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 the Act already, um, you know, lays out um, some of these sort of issues that they can't be from proceeds of crime. Um, you know, the, the donation from foreign donation has, is quite um, heavily limited. So the, the point is that, you know, if, if you keep on tracking the funding and it bounces from A to B to C, the, the, the source of the fund is essential, right? Because we have to understand where, if, if, they're, if they're legitimate and if the donor had the ability to actually make make that donation. It's, it's around legality, I suppose. Michael, when we look again at the funding, uh, a party like the ANC, it is still the biggest party in, in South Africa. But again, it uh, seems to be sitting quite sort of um, a little bit lower down on the list in terms of the amount of money that has been declared. Do you think there's an underreporting from the ANC or that they're genuinely struggling to raise funding? You know, I would be reluctant to express an opinion that might lead to me being sued for defamation. Um, but the first thing to point out, the ANC has had the larger share of the public funding. So we have to realize that, you, you know, in in there was an extra allocation uh, approved in December. So in a sense, the election year is almost like a double year in terms of public funding. So the ANC uh, would have had around 300 million rand in public funding, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, through this, this election period. So it's not as though they don't have so other sources of income, uh, as we discussed earlier. But there are clearly concerns about whether parties are spending greatly more than the declared funding. And obviously the ANC, those questions are going to be raised. The EFF have not declared any donations except for the donation in kind, which uh, MTN gave obviously SIM cards and, and uh, whatnot to, to, to the EFF and to the ANC. So, yes, the, those two parties, and then there, there are questions uh, in contour with Cizwe, uh, although they're a new party, they have clearly spent quite a lot in terms of election campaigning, uh, events, gear, you know. So those things, there are visible manifestations of campaigning. And as yet, we're not seeing the source of those funds. 
Add, add to that, perhaps, uh, a, a party again, like a change starts now, Michael, uh, because at the time that that particular organization was launched um, under Roger Jardine, they, there was an impression that there was a significant amount of money that they'd been able to raise to contest the elections. And one looks at their declarations, 150,000 rand. Well, look, obviously, by the time this quarter started, we knew that Change Starts Now was no longer contesting the election. So the large donations came in the previous uh, segment. The fact that that donation, which is registered against Roger Jardine himself, the fact that that donation comes through is rather telling because clearly that donation in itself, there's nothing odd about it. The party would still have incurred some costs you know, even after it was no longer contesting. The question which perhaps you and the media should be asking the party is whether they returned donations that were made uh, previously. You know, that would be an interesting thing to, to find out because given that they weren't contesting the elections, the prior donations would have seen, would, it would seem to have been enough to carry them through. So I, I don't see anything sinister in any of the prior or current declarations there. But there are, it, but this is the great thing about the legislation. It raises questions. People can go and ask and find out. We're not just left in the dark. Joel, when it comes to what do you believe then, the future of um, transparency around political party funding is, do you think that um, this legislation has changed the way in which donors interact with political parties because we know that the parties themselves have said this is it's making life difficult that they are unable to raise funds as a result of this the opposition has always been that people businesses should be able to proudly and um, publicly make donations that it's not a the political do donations should not be a, a dirty word, that you should be able to support and put money in, in, into the vision you want to see for the country. Um, the fact that parties may be experiencing difficulties in um, getting donations has to do with the history of what happened when there was secrecy and unfettered movement, right? Uh, and that's why we have things like the, the Guptas and, um, and Bosasa. So if Parties, it, you know, it isn't maybe the case that donors are more hesitant because of, of, of their reputational interest, right? That they want to donate to parties that they know are going to be um, clean and following, you know, democracy. Um, so I don't necessarily agree that, you know, that, that from, the, from day one, parties have been saying this is going to, we, we're going to struggle do, to do this. But we really have to balance out the rights of, you know, our political rights and then the needs of political parties. Michael? Yes, I, I think I understand the reluctance and certainly in the past, for example, the DA declined to respond to the PIA requests on the basis that others weren't doing so. So, you know, uh, one-sided declarations in the past would clearly have been problematic and we understand the reluctance. You know, there could be people who would donate but would be afraid to show that they are supporting a political party, perhaps those that may have, let's say, government contracts in one place but want to donate to a different party in, in a different place. But I agree with Joel that the overall uh, imperative of transparency and openness overrides some of the difficulties that parties may experience uh, you know, from particular donors, you, you, you know, it's just we, we have to we have to have it out in the open. And yes, there may be consequences, but people need to adjust to that new situation. Michael Atkins, Joe Bergman, let me thank you both for your time and your contributions to this conversation. And both of them, of course, are correct. The, the reporting is improving, but we still have a long way to go.